It's early in the morning, September 1918, the twilight of the First World War. Olympic, a troop ship, is making its way from Southampton. All is calm, but beneath the waves, a predator lurks. It's a German submarine, a U-boat, and its commander has Olympic perfectly in his sights. He waits patiently for his shot. Two torpedoes have been fired. They roar through the water at great speed. Each carries a 195 kilogram warhead. Just three years earlier, the RMS Lusitania was torpedoed and sunk in very similar circumstances. Now the torpedoes bear down on Olympic. Impact is a certainty. This attack on Olympic actually happened. It was in the final stages of the First World War, and it's believed that the submarine U-53 fired the offending torpedo. Now, one of them missed, but one of them hit dead center, but didn't detonate. If Olympic had sunk that morning, it would have been the end of the Olympic class as a whole, because Titanic and Britannic were gone, and it would have been a real shame, because the 1920s were some of the best years of Olympic's career. Just a year following the First World War, Olympic continued to serve as a troop ship, repatriating British and Canadian soldiers. She had been hastily repainted in her peacetime colours, perhaps a little too hastily, because in patches the black paint of the hull wore off and you could see her striking camouflage pattern beneath. Olympic's problems were not just cosmetic, however. The ship had been driven hard for four years of war, and her plumbing, electrical and engineering systems all needed care and overhaul if she was to re-enter the passenger service. A tired Olympic was finally retired from Admiralty service and made it back to her builders, Harland & Wolfe in Belfast, Northern Ireland in August 1919. The ship had transported some 200,000 people safely over 36 trooping voyages, surviving submarine attacks and even having managed to sink one in action. Four years earlier, in 1916, her larger and newer sister ship, Britannic, had struck a mine off Greece while serving as a hospital ship and sank. Now it was up to Olympic to shoulder the burden of the ever popular Southampton to New York service. The liner was fatigued and her refit would be extensive. The biggest change made to Olympic during this time was to her machinery. Olympic had originally been built as a coal burning ship. This had been the primary means of feeding ship's boilers for decades. But as early as 1912, thought had been given to converting Olympic to burn oil fuel instead. This had a number of advantages. First, it meant that the large number of hands required to endlessly shovel coal into the furnaces would no longer be needed. In fact, the engineering complement was reduced from 350 to just 60 men. It also changed the refueling process. Bunkering coal took days and was a dirty, grimy business, coating the ship's hull in thick coal dust and soot. Instead, refueling could now be complete in just five or six hours, as liquid oil was pumped into the bunkers. There was a bit of good foresight here too. In my What Happened to Olympic After Titanic Sank video, we analysed the additional inner skin which had been added and subdivided into small, cellular, watertight compartments. These could now be used to store additional liquid fuel oil, giving Olympic an impressive capacity and range. The conversion to oil drove another small external change. Olympic, Titanic and Britannic had all originally been fitted with small triangular coaling outriggers with their wires slung out along the promenade deck. These had been used to act sort of like cranes, slinging buckets of coal into the ship's sides during refueling. They weren't needed anymore, so they were deleted, giving Olympic's side a nice clean look. 
Additional safety measures were introduced too. Previously, watertight doors in Olympic's boiler rooms had to be closed manually, a process which could take up to two minutes. After her refit, the system was entirely automated from the bridge, powered by electricity, and took less than 20 seconds. Her ventilation systems were improved, and she received a whole new lifeboat plan. All in all, she could now carry 50 lifeboats, many designed to nest inside another. Two of these boats were 28 foot long motorboats, which even carried their own wireless set. This gave Olympics lifeboats a capacity for almost 3,500 people. Inside, Olympics' full pre-war glory was restored. All of the wood panelling and decoration that had been removed during the war was restored, and anything that was damaged was replaced with panels which had been built, but never fitted, to the Britannic. This all took 10 months, but finally, in 1920, the shining, all-new RMS Olympic proudly steamed into Belfast Lock and the open ocean. To the casual observer from the outside, she would have looked about the same as she did when she first left her shipbuilders in 1911. But now, instead of thick coal smoke pouring out of her funnels, there was just the slightest wisp of oil smoke instead. Olympic was ready to face the 1920s and a whole new era. Now it would be a little bit remiss of me not to mention this small event uh, that occurred. We all know Olympic had a little penchant for the dramatic, and when she was steaming from Belfast to Southampton that first time, powered by oil, a huge fire broke out caused by faulty valves. The faulty valves allowed extra fuel oil to escape, which then caught a light in one of the boiler rooms. It was under control in 15 minutes, thanks largely to a fire extinguishing system installed exactly for this reason. But it's just one more interesting event in Olympic's colourful career. Anyway, Olympic returned to service and was billed by the White Star Line as the largest oil-burning passenger ship afloat. Her first post-war transatlantic voyage was billed as a second maiden voyage, but by 1920, hers was a household name, and the ship had become a bit of a legend. She was booked to the brim and carried 2,249 passengers in absolute style and comfort. The crossing was a success, and it set the scene for the early 1920s. She steamed into New York Harbour, having averaged 21 knots across the Atlantic. On that voyage, she carried the New York Symphony Orchestra, who were returning after a successful tour of Europe. They played on deck as reception boats circled the liner. All seemed well, except that Typhus had recently broken out in Serbia, and Olympic, on that voyage, was carrying 180 people from there in third class. The ship had to be quarantined for five days, to the annoyance of many. Regardless, the crossing had been a great success, and Olympic was back in the spotlight as one of the most prestigious ocean liners on the transatlantic run. With Britannic having been lost, White Star's transatlantic service was now run by a mismatched pair of liners, the old RMS Adriatic of 1906, one of White Star's so-called Big Four, originally intended to sail from Liverpool to New York, now served alongside Olympic, which was 21,000 gross registered tons bigger and five knots faster. Regardless, in 1920, the odd couple managed 37 Atlantic crossings, many of them booked out in a post-war boom, and they carried 60,000 people between them. Olympic became a favourite for the rich and famous, carrying the likes of Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford and Percy Rockefeller. Her passenger lists include millionaires, politicians, generals, judges, socialites, stars, and she earned herself the nickname of the film star liner in the press. The years 1920 to 1921 were good years for Olympic, as the post-war merchant shipping world still reeled and plans were yet to be finalised for running mates and rivals. But then, in 1922, things were to change with the introduction of a new generation of superliner that would steal some of Olympic's spotlight. Cunard had lost Lusitania in 1915, but the post-war boom had begun to serve them well too. Aquitania proved to be a transatlantic champion, carrying 60,000 passengers in 1921 to Olympics 37,000. In 1922, Bertram Hayes, Olympics master through the final years of World War I and through 1920 and 1921, was transferred to a newer, larger ship. She had been built in Germany for Hamburg America Line as the Bismarck, but was not finished before the war broke out. Instead, she was awarded to Britain as a war reparation in view of the loss of Britannic, and was then bought by White Star Line. She was certainly impressive. 
This superliner was over 950 feet long and 56,000 gross registered tons. Olympic was no longer the largest liner in the White Star Fleet, nor the flagship. That honour went to this new behemoth liner, which had been renamed Majestic. Finally, three large ocean liners were servicing White Star Line's Southampton to New York service, but it was an odd lineup to say the least. Fairly early on, White Star Line had recognised that more than two ocean liners of equivalent size would be needed to operate a regular and reliable transatlantic service like clockwork. With three ships, one could be departing Southampton for New York, another departing New York for Southampton, and a third still could already be mid-ocean in either direction. The company's dream envisaged this service being maintained by Olympic, Titanic and Britannic, but that dream had died with Titanic and Britannic's loss. The company would have to make do with what it had at hand. Now, the busy transatlantic service would be operated by Majestic, Olympic, and the smaller Homeric, another war reparation, originally the former German liner Columbus. It was an odd trio, but their matching was driven by necessity. White Star was finally ready to face the 1920s and beyond, and compete with Cunard as best they could. To create visual consistency across the fleet, and perhaps to refresh the brand a little, Olympic's gold shear line was lowered, along with that of Homeric and Majestic, so that it sat further down on the hull. From 1922 on, Olympic recorded some of her fastest crossings, averaging speeds in excess of 22 knots, and even recording a speed record of 24.2 knots. This good turn of speed came in handy in 1923, when the United States Line's SS Leviathan, which was also originally a German-built liner, the same class as Majestic, was overtaken by Olympic in a storm. This sparked a friendly rivalry between the two ships, who unofficially raced against one another, but Leviathan had the upper hand, thanks to an extra 40,000 horsepower in her engines. By the mid-1920s, it was clear that Majestic was carrying a larger number of passengers compared to Olympic, thanks in no small part to that ship's huge second and third class capacity. Olympic, however, was still a favourite for the rich and famous, and she was probably one of the most popular liners afloat. By 1927, White Star Line was planning to build and introduce a new superliner in excess of 1,000 feet long and by far the most luxurious ship afloat. The company had wanted to replace Homeric, which just wasn't in the same league as Majestic and Olympic. So to prepare for the change, Olympic would need to be modernised and refitted. The late 1920s were a totally different world to that which had existed when the Olympic class was first dreamt up in 1909 by White Star Line executives. Would Olympic be able to keep up with the shifting social changes of the 1920s, or would she be left behind, a relic of the Edwardian age? The next time we visit Olympic's career, we'll take a look at how White Star Line was able to refresh the ship and keep it abreast of all of the social change that was happening in the late 1920s, because even all the way through until her scrapping in the early 1930s, Olympic was still a favourite on the transatlantic service. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. Every little bit helps, and I aim to make a video like this once every week, so you'd hate to miss out. Or you can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.